problems at all. The problem is that there are just too few competent diagnosticians. With the use of the computer consultant for soybean disease diagnosis, farmers can be as expert a diagnostician as I am virtually 24 hours a day. The impact of artificial intelligence on society, on the world, I think is, rather, is going to be rather profound. Uh, there will be some um, dramatic impact, say, in employment. The uh, kinds of jobs that uh, up to now only humans can perform that involve intellectual effort, uh, perhaps some clerical effort, um, work by experts, in fact, are going to be at least aided by machines. And so uh, probably there will be less of a need, I think, for humans to be performing those kinds of tasks. This presents society with some very interesting questions as to um, how it uh, utilizes human beings and uh, how it compensates human beings. I think the opposite is really the case because it's the whole... Dr. Lou Robinson, IBM's director of liaison with the universities. When we, uh, as a society, invent devices like steam shovels that help us uh, do large construction projects like build canals, uh, we don't feel that we've denied ourselves the opportunity for labor. In the same sense, mach uh, computing machines are designed to help us relieve ourselves of certain intellectual kinds of activities that are burdensome, tedious, repetitive, or even difficult or impossible to do because of the volumes of data involved that suddenly we can do with machines and very effectively. I think what it creates is a challenge to creativity, a challenge to think of new things to do, of new ways to apply these machines. And that's the view that I hold about artificial intelligence in general. It's obviously a gamble whether or not artificial intelligence will have the same effect on employment as automation. Robots like this one can weld a car body more efficiently than humans. Nevertheless, up to now, they've been what Professor Donald Mickey of the Machine Intelligence Research Unit at Edinburgh calls DIM robots. Well, DIM robots are the robots we have on the factory floor today in all the advanced countries. They're blind and dumb, they don't understand their surroundings. And uh, the other kind of robot, which will dominate the technology of the late 1980s in automation, and also is of acute interest to experimental artificial intelligence scientists, is the kind of robot where the human can convey to its machine assistants his own concepts, uh, suggested strategies, and the machine, the robot, can understand him. But no machine can accept and utilize concepts from a person unless he has some kind of window on the same world that the person sees. And therefore, to be an intelligent robot to a useful degree, as an intelligent and understanding assistant, robots are going to have artificial eyes, artificial ears, artificial sense of touch. It's just essential. And indeed, they're being given these senses already. That same robot has now been given enough visual sense for it to avoid knocking Snoopy off his perch. But it's banged its elbow, so it assesses the situation with its TV eye and takes avoiding action and steers around Snoopy another way. A dim car welding robot wouldn't even know Snoopy was there. Now, a computer that could see things for itself would represent a quantum jump in artificial intelligence. Professor Igor Alexander at Brunel University in England has connected a TV camera to a computer and taught it to recognize faces. Hello, Bruce. Hello, John. Intruder. Intruder. The computer immediately spots the odd man out. The security applications are obvious, but how does the computer manage to recognize such a variable pattern as a human face? The answer is a direct crib from the human brain. It's wired up as an artificial neural network with a maze of interconnections. Hello, this neural network enables Hello, the computer people. to take an intelligent guess at the Hello, identity of the face people. it's looking at. Hello, Even changing your expression doesn't put it off. Hello. 
On the contrary, the computer Hello. responds accordingly. Hello, Igor. Hello, Igor. Hello, Igor. Hello, Igor. The same program can read words, and not just words written in computer code. Signatures, for example. Could this be a way to speed up the rate at which computers can learn? We asked Professor Alexander if his computer could be developed to read, say, Encyclopedia Britannica. Reading is no problem at all. It's extracting meaning from what's being read that is difficult. That's our project for the moment. In this laboratory, we're developing an artificial neural network, which we hope very soon will do just that. Computers seem set to learn at a rate which far outstrips our speed of learning. They may even understand what they learn. But the hallmark of human intelligence is the Eureka effect. Will computers be able to come up with anything new? Well, we might also ask, can a human generate anything new? I think human beings are uh, excellent at being able to put uh, ideas together and come up with something that appears new. I think in the same sense, uh, computers will be able to analyze ideas that they already have, put them together in novel ways that will uh, produce something quite dramatically new. As an illustration, back at Stanford University, Professor Doug Leonard describes his computer program. The research I'm currently involved in is the building of a program called Eurisco. Eurisco's task is to discover new knowledge. It does a kind of open-ended theory formation, almost like scientists carrying out research. Eurisco was started out with a set of about a hundred very simple math concepts dealing with sets and functions. And after about an hour of running, the program discovered the notion of counting, uh, natural numbers, and very quickly applied some more rules of thumb that it has to generate the notions we think of as arithmetic and elementary number theory. It eventually went on into geometry and rediscovered a lot of Euclid's theorems. The most dramatic new knowledge Doug Leonard's program has generated seems at first sight merely incestuous. The brain power of a computer resides here in thousands of tiny transistors etched onto a flat sheet of silicon the size of a tea leaf. Planning the internal connections for these minute components is a nightmare, and computers already help. Professor Leonard's program has come up with previously unimaginable three-dimensional chip designs that will make future computers far more powerful. Computer intelligence seems set to pull itself up by its own bootstraps. If ever intelligent computers learn to design super-intelligent computers, how will we get on with them? Professor Edward Fredkin has been a key figure at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology since artificial intelligence research began. He's also a highly successful businessman. As these machines evolve and as some intelligent machines design others and they get to be smarter and smarter, uh, it gets to be fairly difficult to imagine how you can have a machine that's millions of times smarter than the smartest person and yet is really our slave doing what we want. Now, we've been training chimpanzees to talk in sign language and uh, of course a lot of progress has been made there but if we ever get a chimpanzee that can really communicate and we tried to talk to him what we'd find is that he's interested in talking about things like uh, where can he find a banana and uh, will you tickle me or uh, playing games that chimpanzees like to play but if you want to talk to them about nuclear disarmament and uh, who's going to be elected president they simply won't be interested and on the other hand, we would be very little interested in discussing for long what a chimpanzee has on its mind. Likewise, I think that uh, the artificial intelligences of the future will be worried about weighty problems that we simply can't understand. And uh, they may condescend to talk to us. They may uh, amuse us on occasion or play games that we like to play. And in some sense, they might keep us as pets. Uh, I think that uh, what that means really is they might solve some problems for us like curing certain diseases. They might find it necessary to take some of our toys away, some of our hydrogen bombs and things, but there's no reason that they would want to go after the same things we want because they won't be interested in them. I uh, once owned a Porsche, a very high-powered uh, sports car. I have nothing against high-powered sports cars. I don't want to get along with our technology and so on. I much enjoy driving it. But I wouldn't have let, uh, say, any old 14-year-old uh, boy drive the car. A Porsche in those hands is a dangerous instrument. I think the, uh, the state of, of uh, moral wisdom, say, of our society 
is such that it is, a, it is at best a 14-year-old boy, perhaps, perhaps an 11-year-old boy. And under those circumstances, the very, very powerful tools that we're making, in, and I'm thinking particularly of computers, I think uh, have, to be, have to be looked at as, as at least potentially very dangerous instruments. Evidently, artificial intelligence means different things to different people. Like the elephant and the three blind men, one feels it to be a beast of burden to help us increase production. One fears it to be a dangerous serpent. One thinks of it as a rope flung to rescue mankind in trouble. But what does the elephant think? Indeed, can a machine ever be said to think at all? Professor Mickey. Well, I would say that it's not so much a matter of uh, whether a machine can think or not, which is how you prefer to use words, but rather whether they can think in a sufficiently human-like way for people to have useful communication with them. It's rather the same as arguing whether a boat can swim. Now, naval people will say, no, of course not, it sails. And what they mean is it doesn't make movements like a fish. On the other hand, the aero engineers have settled for a word like fly, and they say, yes, a bird flies, and so does an aeroplane. So that's really arguing about words. I have read in the literature many times the view that the human mind is an ultra-fantastic thing and we get along ordinary, in ordinary life using 5 or 10% of its capacity. And if we could only unleash the other 90%, we'd all be supermen. Uh, my opinion really is that uh, just to get along in society takes maybe 110% of the capacity of a human mind. And as a result, many people are overloaded by just life. Uh, trying to get along in a very difficult world, and they get mentally ill, uh, they get uh, unhappy, and so on. And that we don't really have the capacity, the mental capacity, to manage complicated affairs, like how should Russia and the United States get along in this world so that we don't drop thermonuclear bombs on each other. That's a question that may be too hard for us to deal with, and we may revert to the primitive passions that end up causing war, just because we don't really have the mental capacity to solve these very hard problems and all the other things we have.